Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is David Jordan. I have the pleasure of being one of the pastors here at First Baptist Church of Decatur. And we are thrilled that you are joining us for this evening, for this wild spectacle that we share together. And we are so thankful that in this space that we call a sanctuary, we can share not only a sense of the sacred in the creation that we all share, but also we hope this evening this becomes a brave space where we hear truth and share in what we as a congregation and the broader Decatur community value in having our intellects challenged and our spirits lifted and our imaginations expanded. We're so glad that you're here. We're thankful that you've come for this event tonight, and we look forward to sharing in this together. I'm Shelley Woodruff, also one of the pastors here at First Baptist Decatur, pastor for community engagement. And this is part of our conversation series, which is a more than a decade long initiative we've had here to um, further the larger First Baptist commitment of of working within and for our community with the common goal of, of expanding our vision of the world. And both of our authors that we have here today, both Jessica and Janice, what their writing does is exactly what we hope to do in, in our conversations group, but also in our church. Because we believe that through dialogue and through challenge that we can seek to expand our field of vision little by little and to grow our understanding and appreciation for our world and our place in it. Janice, your work, you poetically place your reader into your lived experience so that we find ourselves as intimately and intricately connected creations. And in that place, paradoxically, we see what we have lost through inattention. So it is an honor to be a part of this conversation, to learn and to expand our vision as a result of what's gonna happen here on our stage today. We also want to say a thank you to our partners for this evening, both Karis Books, who if you have not purchased a book um, from our authors already, they will be out in the narthex after this is over for you to do that. But we're so pleased to purchase with, with Karis, who are right here, are one of our community partners at Decatur. And then also for Georgia Center for the Book, who we continue to work with month after month um, to, to help further their good work that they do in our community. And so I want to introduce their director, Joe Davich, for, to introduce to our speakers this evening. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, y'all. It's been a hot minute. Um, we're, we're still working all of this stuff out. It's a, it's a brave new world out there. Um, you know, we've been virtual for a long, long time. We're still not over at the building yet. You know, some folks, our hair got a little longer, got a little grayer, but we're still around and we're glad that you're here and we're glad that you're not only supporting the Center for the Book, um, but First Baptist Church as well, who, as it's mentioned, has been our partner to do events since long, long ago at the Decatur Book Festival um, when it became my job to convince First Baptist Church to be a, a, a site host and, um, you know, maybe get over there, um, you know, little hesitation about an author who wrote about vampires in Louisiana named Charlene Harris. Uh, but it has worked well for so many years and you know, we thank them all the folks back there who are running the soundboard and making sure this is streaming out to everyone, um, as well as the sound for tonight. You know, Deborah and all of her volunteers at check-in. You know, these things just don't happen in a bubble. Karis Books, who is our local feminist bookstore um, and whose birthday is this month, which we all love to celebrate. And it reminds me that mine is about the same time. So it's like, uh, okay, that's coming up as well. But they have copies out there um, and do purchase the books. The independent bookstores across the country have done such an amazing job during this pandemic, mailing books to home, doing curbside pickup. Some folks even did book drop offs. So if you're even watching from home, wherever you are, we do encourage you to buy from independent bookstores, especially black owned independent bookstores, because we really want to have a diverse and just society. So do bear that in mind. So as far as diversity goes, I always seem to have the wonderful job of introducing intelligent, 
and creative and powerful women. And they're Georgians, and it just makes me so proud. Um, and we have two of them tonight who are truly beloved Georgia authors. Um, our interviewer tonight is Jessica Handler. She is the author of Magnetic Girl, which was an Indie Next selection, a Wall Street Journal Spring 19 pick, and a Bitter Southerner Summer 19 pick. We all remember summer of 2019, right? Just, yeah, I mean, it's one that you, we remember that. Um, but she also writes nonfiction. She has a beautiful book called Braving the Fire, a guide to writing about grief, and of course, her first memoir, Invisible Sisters, which was on the list of books all Georgians should read. Of course, a long, great tradition of Georgia authors is the author Janice Ray, who writes about the intersection of nature and humans and culture and how they all intersect. Um, I think we all remember her book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, but she also has written um, Wild Spectacle, which we are here to talk about tonight. She has won a Pushcart Prize, an American Book Award, a Southern Be Bookseller Award, and a Southern Environmental Law Center Writing Award, in addition to a Nautilus Award. I am so very pleased that both of these ladies are joining us here this evening. Don't forget, if you have a question after the formal presentation, feel free to step up to the microphone. And although all the books have been pre-signed, if it is a gift or something special, Janice has agreed to personalize a few of those at the end of tonight. Once again, Thank you all so much for joining this evening. Keep reading, keep coming to the events, and keep building these communities. And please join me to welcome Jessica Handler and Janice Ray. Joe, thank you. And Janice, nice to see you. Um, what we want to do tonight is Janice is going to read for us a little bit, and we're going to uh, converse about this book. But before we start, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, um, Wild Spectacle is dedicated to my teachers, and I want Janice to know that she's been a teacher to me about writing and about how to do my best to live mindfully in the world. So I didn't tell you I was going to say that. I learned some things from this book, and I want to tell you what they are. One, that the collective noun for bears is sleuths, that the collective noun for thunderheads is guild. I learned how to manage transitions in essays in an essay called The Duende of Cabo Blanco, which we're going to talk about. Cryptobiotic soil, you can't walk on it because it takes hundreds of years to grow. A frog's mating position is called amplexus the existence of a world spider catalog, and that there are recordings from the early 20th century of hollering in the Okefenokee as a message, uh, as a method of kind of locating yourself. So these treasures await you. You know, Janice, you write in Birdmen of Belize, quote, that I've always been in love with the world as long as I can remember. And I would love it if you would read a little bit for us uh, from an essay in this book. Thank you all so much for coming today. It's just, I don't know, it's a little gloomy and rainy out there, and I'm just so grateful that you gave up this time. I've been reading a book called How to Do Nothing, and it's like how to remove yourself from the attention economy, you know, the things that want to, they, they want to commodify your attention. And the long and short of that book is, the, is to gather together with friends. And I feel that's what we're doing tonight, that I, you're my friend. I hope I'm your friend. Jessica's my friend. And I'm really glad that here we are with real people, um, yeah, saying real things to each other. Thanks to the Georgia Center for the Book, South Carolina Reads, Jessica Handler, and again, and oh, David, Shelley, and Anne, everybody at First Baptist Church of Decatur, thank you so much for having me and having Jessica here. Thank you. And to all of my friends in the audience, thank you for coming again. Um, Jessica told me she was going to ask me to read something. This is a very short essay, if you are willing. Are you willing if, to, if we start with just an essay? It's only a few pages. Manatees. Have you heard me? Have you heard this book? Manatees. Uh-oh. This holding the microphone thing. 
Everything's jumbled up. The ones with feet are in the water, although they can't go anywhere. The ones without feet can go where they want. The ones without hands can touch. It's early morning, November, and I heave out of a guide boat, splashing into the water at the exact place where one of Florida's high magnitude springs, Three Sisters, rises into a Blackwater River crystal. I'm wearing a black wetsuit, tight as an extra layer of skin and a snorkel mask. I'm here to see manatees, which will not hurt you, I am told, and in their curiosity may approach, though I may not move toward them or even reach out to touch one should it approach. The water is 72 degrees, the air chilly, and to keep warm, I stay submerged. I can't see more than 10 or 12 feet in the light green silty water. If manatees are below or around me, as the guides promised, I can't tell. I puff through the blowhole of the snorkel, my face turned away from the light. Trying to make sense of the furry stumps and uneven topography of the sepulchral river bottom. Suddenly, two monstrous shapes materialize out of the watery gloom. They are titanic. They are within yards before I see them, and my heart leaps. Manatees are vegetarian, I tell myself. They eat water weeds and grasses. The manatees paddle slowly, buoyant, languidly moving a fin to propel. Both of them head straight toward me. Who would have imagined their curiosity? Who would have dreamed they wanted us? They glide past, looking at me. They note my big glass eyes, my seal-like skin, my shivering. You can touch us, they say. In the next moment, I break federal law. I reach out and let the body of the second manatee brush against my hand. The manatee instantly pivots, as if touch communicated something necessary. It positions itself alongside me, rolls over, and presents its belly. Its fins are like arms, its tail huge and rounded. It keeps looking at me with one comely brown eye. I am pretty sure that the manatee wants its belly scratched. I put my hand there. Its hide is rough, covered with crusty barnacles, slimy with algae, and soft, mammalian, warm. That quickly, a manatee is in my arms. I can't talk, I can't smile, I can't say anything with my eyes. All I have to communicate with is my hand, now softly stroking the manatee's belly, and also one other thing which I don't have a name for. After a minute, the manatee slowly paddles on. Three others come, then they go. They all seem to be taking turns checking out visitors. Now below, I can make out the manatees resting on the river bottom in deep greenish silt. What I thought was the pocked bed of the river is a fat knot of sea cows defenseless and strange. Some seem to lie atop each other in a surreal and merciful sweetness. When one needs air, it lifts lazily through the layered, calcinated water and then sinks again in that slow fall from sparkle to decay. I quit using my hands. I pump my feet and glide. I glide again, I roll. What interests me this morning is a cathedral of spring, how the rays of new sun refract to points in front of me in the clear and unspeakable water. When a manatee approaches, easing next to me, I put my goggled head against its side. My cheek rests against a series of rigid scars the propellers of motorboats have cut this animal deeply, more than once. I blow water from my tube and examine the manatees I can see. Almost all of their backs are scarred. Then a mother and calf dispatch from the group below. They dally closer. The calf sees me and quits nursing. It comes up swimming as if I'm its friend. 
It tumbles next to me. It looks in the, me in the eyes. It swims. It tumbles again. I roll with it, breathing when I reach the surface. The mother nudges the baby away, and she rubs her body against mine. She rolls. She does this again and again. The manatees have mistaken me for something I am not. The mother stops rolling. With her searching eyes, she pours over me. She puts her face next to mine, looking. The manatee's eye is a wrinkled spiral. Immersed in all the unknown, all the mysteries, we gaze at each other. I shouldn't tell you what happened. It's too precious, really, to reveal something like this so randomly. But maybe if I tell you, your life will be touched, as mine was, and some magnetic poles deep within you will align. I feel the manatee and myself entering another plane. It's wordless and weightless, fluid, a beautiful light. A million crystals are sparkling. We are in the world. The human constructed world where an eco tour guide waits on a boat with dry towels and a cup of hot cocoa, but also another world. There's no word really for this place we've come. It's one of the other worlds, a place beyond reason, beyond the material, beyond the visible. A manatee's spirit is big, and it will merge with a human spirit which is also big. And then I hear the manatee mother speak. She is beseeching me. You must help us, she says. You must help us. I hear her distinctly. You must help us. She turns, blows at the surface, nudges her baby, and sinks away back into the dissension of the primitive river bottom. Something rises in me that has been rising for a long time, and I break into the sentient air, dizzy, trembling, and blind with love. Thank you. I think we should applaud. Thank you. That essay leads me to my next question, or the thing that I want to talk about, which is, you write that the essays in this book are about the desire to become the kind of person who listens to animals and to whom animals listen. And I'm curious, what do you think are the characteristics or the traits um, of that kind of person? To what do we aspire? Gosh, you don't pull any punches, do you? Um, I, I was... Um, well, let me just say, I had this idea, and I was doing a reading in upstate New York, and I ran into a Native American writer named Joseph Bruchak. You may know his work. And he's the one who first told me, he started telling me these stories of, of animals listening to people. And I thought it was, you know, I thought it just bordered on, you know, woo-woo uh, magic. And I went to Florida Gulf Coast University to, to teach. The, the university was built on a wetland, and part of the mitigation requirement was that every incoming student had to take an environmental studies 101 class. So during the semester I was there teaching, I taught one of these sessions. And every session, an Abenaki man named Oness came and did a, he did a, he did a session on, um, Native American relationship with the earth. So my colleagues told me that this strange thing happened, that every time he came, an animal would come up to listen. If he, if he brought the students out to the lake, it might be an alligator or a squirrel. So I, you know, I didn't really believe that. But then came the time for Ones to come to my class. And I, my students were out on the green, and we were sitting in a circle. and. Um, I noticed something with its head stuck out of this thick mown grass coming toward us, and it was a black racer. It had its head out of the grass. Ones was talking. It comes around the circle of students and hunkers down in a bush behind him. So, you know, it, it was like, so that opened me up to this idea of, of can we become, like how do we become the kind of person that 
listens to animals and that animals listen to. And so, Jessica, I think your question is, what kind of person is that? Well, it has to be a person who just spends, an, you know, an unbelievable amount of time in the wild. And I don't really know what else to say, but I think, you know, yeah, I just, yeah. Yeah. I, I'll accept that. <laughs> it's got to be a person driven by some kind of passion, too, to hear things beyond words. To hear things beyond words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be aware of the environment that you are in. So yeah. that leads me to kind of skip to my next question, which is, I'm going to skip a question and go ahead, which is, you write in uh, Exaltation of Elk, and I want to talk about how these essays are also titled and decked with location, but we'll get to that. But you write in Exaltation of Elk that because of our invisibility, we, the people in the essay, were able to see more than if we had been large in a, in a small wilderness. And later in that essay, you write, we turned into rocks. Mm -hmm. We turned into rocks. How do we cultivate this kind of invisibility particularly in an urban setting, or if we can't spend, as you say, a lot of time in the wilderness? Wait, Jessica, say the first part of that question again. How do we How do we find... cultivate that kind of invisibility? How do we encourage ourselves to turn into rocks so that we can integrate with what we're seeing and hearing? Mm -hmm. so, so it's so funny you're picking out these pieces that, that sort of show uh, me as an animist, you know, and I guess I am. We are yeah. animals. Yeah. No, an animist. Animist. Like, oh, animist, yes. Yeah. Um, how do we do it in an urban environment? Yeah. Oh, gosh, I think it'd be easy, you know? You just, you have to, first of all, you're going to have to unplug and then sit still, ground. That means, that means like you've got to have some leather between yourself. You've got to, you can't have, you've got, you can't, you got to have some conductor between your own feet and the ground. But yeah, grounded and listening. Yeah. Anywhere. Because urban, urban places, suburban, rural, it, this is all the earth, you know? Yeah. Thank you. We're all magnetic girls <laughs> and boys. Well, I told you, you have a line in here that I loved, which is you write in the essay, Nightlife, uh, that we confuse artificial light with enlightenment. And um, I wish I'd have used that in Magnetic Girl. But yes. Um, talking about writing, these essays and all of the work of yours that I know combine reportage and observation of the world around you and ruminating about the world within you, right? And so I want you to talk to us, if you will, about the choices you make about form in building these essays and writing them because some of them are collaged, some of them are braided, some of them are funny. Mm -hmm. And also form really, of course, drove ecology very much too, your first book. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us a little bit about the authorial choices you make in form and how that relates to the reader, what you want the reader to get. Oh gosh, that's a great question. And we could get really deep in the weeds with this because I like I think a lot of the magic of writing happens in form. Yeah. And I think a lot of writers sort of pay no attention to it. But there's a beautiful book by John McPhee called Draft Number Four, where he actually, have you seen that? He draws out structures like this essay is shaped like a spiral. This one is shaped like a train on a track with lots of boxcars on it. It's, it's a really amazing thing. And I have a new book that I've been reading. It's called Shapes of Native Nonfiction, which talks about you know the Native American shape, uh, shapes like coiling, braiding, weaving, and, and so forth. Um, I, think it, I think if you're a writer, if you, can, if you can go back and look at your work and see how you've put the pieces together, you're, you're in a great place. You're, so, so Jessica, some of what I do, so in, in ecology, I'm alternating personal history with natural history, right? To show how those, those are two different narrative arcs that parallel each other. And a lot of times I actually do that alternating thing that you're talking about, which is a lot of the essays are point counterpoint, meaning so an, an essay comes from that, the, you know, the verb uh, to, to journey. You know, you're 
you're moving towards something. So the essay will be, begin with an idea, like like the Duende that you, we talked about earlier. The, um, there's a Yes, okay, so there's a trip to Costa Rica where I'm volunteering for a month in a national park. And the, the surface layer is the trip to Costa Rica, but then there's this idea of Duende that I'm really trying to investigate and explore while I'm there. So just one more thing. Stanley Kunitz has a poem in, in which he, he it, you know, he lived to, to be a hundred and something. And in, this poem is called Live in the Layers, Not in the Litter. So I, I read that poem a lot and I write, I try to write like that. I think, so we talk about the best creative nonfiction having two layers. You know, it's, yes, it's about the trip to, to Costa Rica and then it's also about Duende. But I think the best work has multiple layers. Right? So let's just think a minute about ecology. It's about my growing up on the junkyard. It's about the diminishment of the longleaf pine forest. It's about the mental illness of my family. You know, it's about the poverty that I experienced as a child. Um, and then the layers just go on and on. It's about my relationship with my dad, my relationship with my mom. So when I'm teaching, and so this is totally craft, and I know Melissa Faye Green is here, so I'm, and Peter Petit's a writer, and Kimberly Coburn's a writer, so I know there's a lot of writers in here, but th yeah, we can get deep into craft here, but it's something that I love to think about a lot. And thank you for noticing that. Well, also, I mean, yes, there's some insider baseball with craft, but also everybody here is a reader. So the yeah. question of the craft of writing and how you build an essay or a longer form book also works to bring in uh, the reader and not only entertain them, but inform them and keep them at the page, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one other thing that just hit me is that, that creative nonfiction has sort of three parts, and one is the scene, you know, the anecdote itself that you're writing about, like fishing with a, a handheld piece of wood fishing rod on a beach, on a wild beach in Costa Rica. So that's the scene, you know, who was there walking around saying things, doing things, what happened? But the two other parts are summary because you can't write every scene. And then the third part is reflection. And this is the piece, you know, like we all want to tell what we believe to the world, but I believe in like shrinking that down, but really going deep with it. You know, what does this mean? So, you know, a lot of free writing. What I'm really trying to say here is, and on the top level, the writing is so cinematic. I mean, there's one part where you refer to a, to a stingray the size of a trampoline. Um, I've, I had to put the book down. I was just like, wow. So that, that really brought that home yeah. to me. This, a stingray the size of a trampoline. So since we're there, I mean, that's a metaphor, right? And metaphors are these amazing things because they, you know, they, that comes from the Greek word to carry over. So you use one idea to mean something else. And what you present the, to the reader are two things at once. And metaphors are just these vessels that hold all kinds of layers of ideas. So, yeah. Well, since you were talking about Duende, since yeah. you were talking about Duende. Duende. Let's talk a little bit about that essay, The Duende of Cabo Blanco. And how does Duende factor into this book? And also, you're going to have to define it. Yeah, and I don't, so Duende is a mysterious force. You know, in Spanish, it can mean boss, just plain boss. But it also means soul. It means these little elves that, you know, run around among us. But it's really this mystery. It's just this, yeah. So Federica Lorca, Garcia Lorca writes, wrote a lot about this, about the idea of Duende. So when I was in Costa Rica, I was just really trying to think about it. You know, what is it? Us being here right now is really Duende. You know, it's just, it's just a, an amazing moment with a, a great spirit moving around and among us. Um, I don't know that I can define it. It is hard to define. 
Yeah. Yeah. But but you know it when you see it. Like you, you really know it. And also when when you're a writer and you're reading to an audience, you know, like I read um, well, I was down, I won't even say where I was, but I started like, you know, evangelizing about climate change and two people over there got up and left and like, you know, that stuff starts happening. But when you can get in story and you see like something ch changes in the room, people drop down into a different place and then that's really Duende. It's like, it's the place where transformation happens. It's the place where somebody, somebody, somebody who wrote something or performed something is touched by something else, and then they're able to convey that. It's, it's just a magic thing. I'm so grateful for every moment that, of it that I've ever been lucky enough to experience, if I have. Transformation is a key element in Las Monarcas. Will you talk a little bit about Los Monarcas, about that essay, which is right at the midpoint in the book? Yeah. I went to, when I was 40, so I was raised poor and I never had a lot of money to travel. And just while I'm talking about travel, I want to tell you that about 12 years ago, I quit flying for the climate. I'm not saying that you need to quit flying, but I was flying all around, you know, the country telling people they should be paying more attention to the earth. And I feel that if you don't walk your talk, you, are, you, live some, you live a lie, and living a lie is a kind of mental illness. It's a schizophrenia. So I could no longer justify it for myself. Um, I quit, I still travel. I drove here today, and I'll drive home. I, if I have to travel a long distance, I usually take the train. But it has meant, you know, one time I was at a conference with Gary Nabhan. Gary had brought some of his own food to the conference. And he, this was many years ago before the 100-mile diet or the local food movement. But he, he had said that he was going to begin, he was eating like 70, 60 percent of his food from a certain 50-mile radius or something. And I ask him why. I remember, I keep seeing him bring out these mesquite salsa and some kind of tortillas. And he said, I'm trying to weave my life back together. Well, I just think, you know, like we can pursue fame and money and fortune, success, to the degree that we kind of lose touch with the thread of our lives, you know, the golden thread of our own life. And I didn't want to do that. And I will say that stopping flying, I was on a plane once with a woman, and we were, she was up out of her seat before the plane had even taxied to a stop. She was sitting beside me, and I said, it's okay, we're gonna be there in five minutes. And she looked at her watch and she said, in my life, five minutes is everything. And it was sort of that woman, really. It was like, I don't wanna be the woman to whom five minutes is everything. Because honestly, the slower you go, um, you can lengthen your life by paying more attention to every moment. You know, the carpe diem. Jessica, let me read one little piece. Yes, please. When we got to, when we got to the Sierra Madre, the place where um, monarchs overwinter, I was so happy to be there because I remembered seeing the piece in National Geographic when I was a kid about it. I hadn't been listening to the news and there had been a killing frost and it says, so suddenly before us, the ground changed. Something had been dumped. There was a distinct line where the scrap heap began. I stopped dead in my tracks. The material was papery, mottled gray, like pieces of printed material, not a trash bag full, but dump trucks of it. The ground was plagued with raspy gray shredding. Ahead of us, far to the left and to the right, the air began to smell like an old bird nest. So, so many, I mean, just millions upon millions of butterflies had been killed. And then to, just to bring that up, I want to, let me read one more paragraph at the Please, end. Please, I'm not going to stop you. 
The best part came later, after we started down the mountain. The forest was sizzling now, the sun overhead. We began to enter clouds of butterflies. They were waking, opening their wings in huge numbers. Where the sun struck through the canopy, branches of tall firs were set afire with orange. The butterflies dripped fire from twig and stem as they exited the gray masses. The forest filled with fluttering, burning love notes, careening in crazy combustions through the iron green shade of the conifers. The monarchs were like brilliant origami. They were like flames released from the prison of a fire. They were gliding candles. I tried to think of other metaphors, but they were so much like fire. Hanging, they looked like ashes, dead. Flying, they glowed. The sun ignited them until the butterflies became messengers of the sun, our only sun. Is that good enough? Yes, it is. You can just keep reading. I don't need to ask you anything. I just, you should just keep reading. No, it's funner to talk. But you are keeping an eye on time, right? I am, and I think that someone will give me a signal. I think that what we'll do is a couple more questions from me, and Joe is giving me the thumbs up, and then you know we want questions from y'all, right? So start thinking about what you want to ask Janice. I've got maybe two more questions for you. Okay, I'll answer, I'll answer more succinctly. Okay. Um, Maybe. You and your family farm, and I want to know how that connects you to the place that you love. For some reason, the, the, how does it, what with what I love? How does it connect you with the place that you love? Oh, just paying attention, yeah. Just paying attention to the cycles of seasons, of weathers, of moons. It gets me outside more. Yeah, just, you know, and we haven't had a frost yet. This is November 4th. I live in Tattnall County, Georgia, and we have not had a frost. When should we be having a frost? So we should be having a frost. We're a month late. Wow. That's a thing to know. Somebody told me once that, you know, it was, I think it was um, uh, Alice Waters with Chez Panisse. Mm -hmm. She didn't tell me. I read it. She said, she said the first time an old granny in Alabama said her greens tasted like water. The earth should have ground to a halt. And I think that's where we are with climate change. Like we, I don't think we're realizing that it's how, how badly it's sneaking up on us. You know, things just still look too normal. Which leads me to ask about writing as activism. So I actually have two more questions. Uh, Oh no. Writing as activism, and some of that comes from a wonderful essay about food called One Meal Mm -hmm. in this. Um, And you write there about making a meal with your friend Rick Bass, and you talk about your, your letters to him as activism. How is reading you, or Rick Bass, or Natalie Bazile, or, or Camille Dungy, how is writing, how does reading you create activism in us, or how should it? Mm, gosh. Because you want us to yeah. take action. Well, I, I think books have so much power. I, I see, I see books creating, so, so stories transform people. You know, there are lots of ways you can transform. I think I said this to you, Molly, in the interview the other day, so pardon the repetition. Um, thank you for the story on NPR, too. Uh, going to counseling can transform you. Stopping an addiction, you know, even starting a di- an addiction, starting a medicine that you need. Like, there are lots of ways to be transformed. Uh, entering in a, a relationship is a great way to transform because I think we do our best work at becoming better versions of ourselves in relationship with, to others, with others. Um, when I was a kid, my dad would not let us, he didn't have a TV in the house, so he did allow us to go to the library and check out books. You know, I've always said they saved my life because they opened so many possibilities, so many doors. Um, they did it, stories transform people and lead to transcendence because of the narrative arc. You, somewhere in that curve, you have an epiphany. 
I believe, I believe that story arcs have multiple arcs and multiple epiphanies, but there'll be some big one. And it's in that moment that I learn something and change, and then you as a reader can learn something and change. So if we didn't have Marjorie Stoneman Douglas writing River of Grass, we wouldn't have the Everglades. If we didn't have Terry Tempest Williams writing about Escalante Canyon or Bears Ears, that wouldn't have been protected. And it just goes on and on and on. Um, I, 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 I have seen with my own eyes the power that a book can have. Now, books are changing in our world. Y'all know that. Um, probably what has more power these days is a YouTube video, but that is a story, you know, and, 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 and books aren't dead. I mean, I, I just think this artifactual thing that we hold in our hands that has so much power to change us in the moment, to change us permanently, um, they're just going to be with us forever. So I don't know what else to say, Jessica, really, about activism, but I, I just, I do want to admit that I'm, that I am a writer with a mission, that I am not here to entertain. Um, I, I, Joni Tevis did an interview for, I think, Orion Magazine about this book, and she was asking me questions, and her last question was, in five words, what is your uh, credo? And I said, I am not joking around. Yeah. <laughs> I am not joking around. I'm not joking around. Do you want to take us out with Spider Women? We had talked about that a little bit. I love that essay. Um, spider Women, I went into a graveyard in Oxford, Mississippi with two women who are a couple. And um, I learned that there are millions of spiders everywhere not you know how you how when you're a girl scout or a boy scout somebody would take you out in the woods and they'd shine a flashlight and you'd see all these little spider eyes staring back at you not every not like most spiders don't even have that eye shine which is a, a tapetum that reflects light um, so out with these two arachnologists I was like, I, you know, I, I had to come to terms that wild spectacles aren't just the big, large mammalian carnivores in Africa or the right whales calving off the Georgia coast. We are surrounded by millions upon mil millions of spectacles every minute of our lives, and we have to account for those too. But do you mind if I take us out with a paragraph from the last essay? Absolutely not. All right. Just because it's more powerful. Knock yourself out. All right. And she knocked herself out. <laughs> but somebody gave her CPR. One of the most important poses in yoga is a warrior asana. Knees bent and arms outstretched, looking forward over the right fingers. It's a pose that requires strength and balance, training for both the physical body and the wisdom body to respond when we are called to action. In this asana, the demons of ego, fear, and jealousy can be slain. The pose is also a bowing down, a recognition of limitations. Gazing past the fingers, we see both near and far. As my yoga teacher likes to remind me, you need more than a wish. You need burning desire and fierce determination. When I'm in this pose, I know that I'm in training, learning to be aware to not turn a blind eye, to not back down, to not give up. Sometimes the only weapon we have is awareness. Sometimes all we have is a little light that we can shine outward into a big darkness. Sometimes, however, we tap into our superpowers, and then we can transcend and bring about transcendence. Most of us, most of our lives are asked to live small. Most of us quit trying very young to live the bigness we know is possible. Now, no matter what I choose or what is asked of me, I know what I became that long, long night I paddled alone through shamanic darkness in the desolate wilderness just this side of the ultimate wilderness. I've seen that warrior. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, there is a microphone in the middle of the aisle. So Joe, should people just sort of come up to the mic? Do what? Okay. Um, okay. Hop up and take questions, or I can walk around. I guess I have to put my mask on. Who has questions for Janice Ray or for Jessica? And don't be shy. There's oh, no, one. Come on over. Come up. Do you want to come yeah. to the mic in the middle of the room, or if you just want to say something? Yeah, I can repeat it if you want to holler. Most of you have access to me. I've got a contact form on my website. You can ask me a question anytime, but this is a good place if you have a question that you know you might that you want your community to hear and think about too. Uh, so like when was the first time that you realized just how much you like wanted to preserve the world that we have? Like was it an ongoing thing or was there a moment where you realized that you like have to keep this alive for other people? So, so you're, you're, I think you're asking about like a seminal moment for wanting to or just be an active. Or just in general, just, yeah. So, so when I was young, I never knew the word environment. I never heard of an environmentalist, you know, like, I mean, I, I lived way in the country. Um, my grant, like I watched people who loved nature, but I didn't know that it was a thing you could be. And when I went away to school, I came to North Georgia College, which is now North Georgia University in Dahlonega. And one evening, there was a tree, a building was going up on campus and a very large, beautiful tree was set to be cut. And one evening, somebody sneaked out and hung a sign which, which was part of that Joyce poem, Woodman, Woodman, Spare This Tree, for in my youth it shaded me. And it was really, it, that was the first, that was the first time I ever saw anybody who was willing to speak out. Now in my life, I, I had a dad who was willing to speak out for people, for people of, who were in poverty or he was willing to speak out for God. Like there were a lot of things my dad was willing to speak up for. He was willing to speak up for his taxes getting raised too. But I'd never heard anybody love the earth enough to be willing to, yeah, to raise their voice. Yeah, thank you for that question. Anybody else? Thank you. You don't have to ask a question if you don't, but if you do, the mic is oh, there good. for you. It's a little intimidating to go up to them. I don't know that I've ever actually gone up to a mic and asked a question. And I'm hiding behind. Joe, I could mask up and walk around and hand people my mic if that's easier. I'm okay. Um, you said earlier you referred to yourself as an animist. And so that makes me wonder because you seem very sensitive to the spirit of things. Um, and very appreciative of the beautiful um, and the loving spirit of things. So my question is, do you think that there are things who have, have you encountered things that have more of like a, an evil spirit? Do you feel that sort of thing too? Uh, what kind of spirit? Evil, something, oh, something evil. that frightens you or yeah. things that are alive in a bad way. Um, oh gosh, that is so hard. Okay, so when you th say things, do you really mean things or do you mean people? No, I mean the anima. I mean when you see the like spirit that of the may manatee, seem people. when you see the spirit of the place, the iron green of the furs, you, you, you describe a lot of beautiful things. Mm -hmm. and, and I see things in nature that strike me as really frightening. Um, mostly destruction, things we do, um, things that, and then there are, you know, things that are just seem malevolent in general. So mm -hmm. I just wondered if you, oh, gosh, if that, you encounter that, that kind of thing. That is such an interesting question. I've never thought of it and never. No. <laughs> so let me just see if I can think on the fly here to answer. Are there evil spirits? So. Okay, so let me just, let me talk a minute about evil people. I, a long time ago, decided that 
I could not think of a newborn baby, any newborn baby born into the world as an evil thing. Never. Therefore, in my world, I believe that any bad actions that come from a human being have to come from traumas and tragedies and things that happen to that person. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I have to believe that or I could not go on. Yeah. And so, honestly, I don't really look, go around the woods and look at evil at you know, I, even now, I'm, yeah, I always want to believe we all want the best for ourselves and for each other. Yeah. We all love the same things. We want, we want our family, we want to stay healthy. We want to have a good family. We want to have a home that's secure. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to know that we're going to have food in the, on the table tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and yeah. So, so I do look at like the like a tree being cut, and I just don't think evil. I just think yeah. sorrow. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know. Your discussion of the regeneration that occurs in the aftermath of fire. I grew up in South Georgia, um, and so Where did I you always. Live? I'm Where from. Did you? I'm from Albany. Yeah. <laughs> I know Vic Miller, um, and. It really transformed the way I looked at the place I lived in that to think that like fire was a normal part of how the ecology would thrive, right? That destruction was part of a process that was constantly bringing rebirth. So anyway, I love Thank your writing. You so Thank you so much. Good, good Thank evening. you. Thank Fellow you. South Georgian. I think we've got time for one more question. And then Janice is going to, are you going to sign books out front? Is that how that's going to work? I will do. Ah, okay. So I think we've got time for one more question if somebody wants to take the mic. She mentioned Vic Miller and he sent his greetings to you. Okay. Thank you. He's a very good friend of mine. She's mentioning the writer, Vic Miller, who lives near Albany. Thank you so much. Anybody else? One last thing. Thank you all so very much. Yeah, right there. Somebody in the corner. If you holler it out, I'll repeat it. So, on the ballot, do you think humans have a place in the world? On the ballot? On the ballots. Oh, on ballots. Do humans have a, oh, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. So, so the old idea that humans were apart from the world, like apart from wilderness or apart from nature, yeah, I don't subscribe to that. I think, I, I think, and th this, you know, I'm not the originator of this idea. This has been, we've been building this with the environmental movement. But yes, I think humans definitely have a part. I don't blame humans for the destruction on the earth. I blame an economic system. Now, humans invented it. The economic system is industrial capitalism. Capitalism, with capital, in order for capitalism to succeed, we have to take more and more and more natural resources. And the earth cannot support more and more. We're seeing that with the atmosphere right now. Yeah. So I, be, I just think we need, we, need, we need a new economic system and we need a lot of new lifestyle, a lot of lifestyle changes, but, I'm, but we are, we, this is our home. We humans belong on this home. Yes, and then we're stopping. Audiences with politicians, not really. Well, maybe there's a politician in here. Why? You want me to go talk to him? <laughs> thank you all so I much. I want to thank, Great. and I want to thank you, Janice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, Jessica, for this absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you all for coming out this evening. 
taking the time and, and sharing this with us. I know I always talk about being online and being coming into your homes. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in on YouTube and watching this from the home. It's just so fantastic that, you know, we still have this literary community and that we're able to share these kind of things with you all. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, of course, to the South Carolina Center for the Book and everybody in South Carolina watching. And wherever you may be watching, have a wonderful evening, and we will see you all again very, very soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you.